If you would, please open up your Bibles with me to the book of Ephesians. In Ephesians chapter 1, as we continue this series um, through this book, as we're looking at Trinitarian salvation, we're actually coming to the close of this particular subsection of this uh, first chapter where Paul speaks on salvation being accomplished by the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We've already contemplated the Father's role in that, uh, being an elective purpose, election. Uh, And then, of course, the uh, Son's role in redemption, being that uh, which is uh, redemption, uh, specifically His death upon the cross uh, for us, and then the Spirit's work in applying that to our hearts. And that's what we're going to consider this this. Uh, in this sermon is the Spirit's role in, in sealing us. So uh, we're going to look at verse 13 of Ephesians uh, chapter 1. Paul is writing here under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit of God, and he writes this. He says, In him you also, after listening to the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation, having also believed, you were sealed in him with the Holy Spirit, of promise. Let us go to the Lord in prayer, beseeching him that he would bless the preaching of his word. Father, I thank you for your word and for the power that is in it, that it is powerful and effective to change souls and to change lives. I do pray for the hearers, Lord, for they themselves to be brought into your kingdom by your mighty power, for your people to be encouraged, for your name to be glorified, Father, for the name of your Son to be brought the glory, for you to be brought the glory in all things, Father, all things as they redound to your glory, because we know all things are working to your glory. I pray for that, Father. I plead for you to do that according to your mercy and your grace. Father, we praise you. We praise you for your wisdom and your power and your glory. Oh, blessed triune God, we praise you that you have accomplished redemption for your people. I give you glory for that, Lord. Father, I pray all these things and lift up this praise to you through Christ the Mediator. It is in his name I pray. Amen and amen. The title of this sermon is Trinitarian Salvation, The Spirit's Sealing. Part 1. Trinitarian Salvation, the Spirit's Sealing, Part 1. The work of Christ, as mentioned a moment ago, it is glorious. It is powerful. It is wonderful for our minds to dwell upon it, to think about the wondrous cross of our Lord, to think that He shed His blood for us, that He purchased redemption for His people, all out of grace, free grace, unmerited favor. It's truly wonderful to know that he has done that for his bride. But the question is asked, how is that apprehended? How is that brought to the sinner? Well, we know that it is by faith. Surely it is. We know from Ephesians 2.8 that it is by faith we are saved. However, we also are told that it is a gift of God. So how is this gift of faith given? I submit to you, brethren, it is by the power of the Spirit of God, calling the sinner effectually to salvation in Christ alone, giving them the grace to embrace him, to embrace him and all of who he is and all of who he reveals himself to be in the gospel. It is the Spirit that makes the heart of man willing to obey God, to delight in Him, to walk in His truth and His statutes. And it is the Spirit's sealing that keeps Him in the faith all the way to the end, all the way to glory. And so therefore, the work of the Spirit in salvation is what I would like to consider as we look at this passage, and specifically to focus on the Spirit's act of sealing the believer. Sealing the believer. There are three things that we are going to consider from this passage, for it breaks up very clearly into three separate parts. The first thing I would like to consider is the outward call. Secondly, the inward call. Thirdly, the Spirit's sealing. Now, before I do that, of course, 
Briefly, I will recall our context, the context of this passage, uh, that we have um, already looked at the, father, the work of the Father, as mentioned a moment ago, uh, in verses 3 through 6, and then in verses 7 through 12, the work of the Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's interesting, the way Paul uh, glides us into verse 13, or transitions into verse 13. So I'll read, actually beginning at verse 9 to give us an idea of what Paul has just spoken on concerning Jesus, concerning our Lord Jesus Christ, the second person of the Trinity. He says in verse 9, He made known to us the mystery of His will, according to His kind intention which He purposed in Him, with a view to an administration suitable to the fullness of the times, that is, the summing up of all things in Christ, things in the heavens and things on the earth. In Him also we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to His purpose, who works all things after the counsel of His will, to the end that we who were the first to hope in Christ would be to the praise of His glory. Now, at the end of verse 12 there, he spe- or in verse 12, excuse me, there He speaks on us. Specifically, though, when He uses the term we who were the first to hope in Christ, that was the Jews, the Jewish believers. He says that they were to the praise of His glory. And that is for, that is not only applies to them, but to all believers who have ever been saved in all ages. They have been saved by the grace of God to the glory of God. But then in verse 13, he talks about the Gentile believers who also believed the gospel and were also sealed by the Spirit, which is what I want us to consider in this sermon today. So that brings us to verse 13. So as I said, I want to consider three things. Firstly, the outward call. Secondly, the inward call. Thirdly, the Spirit's sealing. So let's look at that first point. The outward call. The outward call. Verse 13. And this first part of the verse speaks to the exclusivity of Christ, as has already been very strongly emphasized thus far in this chapter. Verse 13. In Him... You also. This is something Paul wants to convey to the reader. That Christ is the only way of salvation. And of course the Ephesians already understood this, but it is fitting that Paul repeat himself. Repetition is good, my brethren. Repetition is good. For through it we learn things. Through it things are ingrained in our minds, as it were. Things are quite literally beat into us. It is good to have repetition. And Paul, throughout this chapter already, even though we are only 13 verses into the very book itself, which is six chapters long, Paul has made it abundantly clear that there is salvation in no one else except Christ. Look at what he says in verse 3. Speaking of the Father's work in redemption, listen to how it is so inexorably linked to the second person in the Trinity. That is, namely Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ, just as He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world, that we would be holy and blameless before Him. In love, He predestined us to adoption as sons through Jesus Christ to Himself, according to the kind intention of His will, to the praise of the glory of His grace, which He freely bestowed on us in the Beloved. In Him we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of His grace. So Paul is just making it so clear. The Father chose us in Christ. He he chose us in the Beloved. In Him we have redemption. We were adopted through Christ. It's constant. It's emphatic. There is salvation in no one else. And if you, my dear hearer, have yet to believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ, you are under the wrath and judgment of God, for there is only one place that you can stand where you are in favor with God, where you are no longer a child of the devil, but a child of God, and that is in Christ. You were either standing in the sunlight of, of Christ or in the darkness of sin. So come, come ye who thirst and have life in Christ. Secondly, 
This first part of verse 13 speaks to the gospel in, in, in that being it's the outward call has a couple of different terms that Paul gives to it. One is the message of truth and secondly it's the gospel of salvation. Look at what he says. After listening to the message of truth, the gospel, brethren, is not a collection of myths put together to make one grand story. But no, it has protruded forth from the mind of God, from his very brilliance. And it is historical. It's something that happened in time and space and was documented accurately. Christ's death, his burial and his resurrection, his perfect life, his ascension, his exaltation have been documented in holy writ. They're not things that we wish or merely even hope that happen. But there are things which we know that happen. Therefore, we can know that we have eternal life because we know that our Redeemer has come truly come, that he really did live as man, flesh and blood, truly God, truly man, very God, very man. In fact, Paul emphasizes the historical aspect of the gospel in the book of 1 Corinthians. I invite you to turn there with with me in your Bibles, 1 Corinthians 15. And this is right after that very famous passage that I oftentimes mention in my preaching because it is so important that we define the gospel. We clearly define what the gospel is and we use uh, the scriptures to do so. And verses 3 and 4 just defines that, that it's Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. However, I want us to emphasize something else in this passage. Look with me at verse 5. Um, and I'll actually read the, the um, last part of verse 4 to give us a little bit of a, con- a context. Uh, he says at the end of verse 4, And that he was raised on the third day, according to the scriptures, verse 5, And that he appeared to Cephas, that, that's um, uh, Peter, then to the twelve, and after that he appeared to more than five hundred brethren at one time, most of whom remain unto now, but some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James and to all the apostles, and last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared to me also. So Paul is, is, is giving these examples. He appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve. Then he appeared to, which was very interesting, over 500 brethren at one time. And then as of the time of Paul's writing this letter to the church at Corinth, he says most of these people remain until now. Some, however, have fallen asleep, a.k.a. they have passed away, they've died. Uh, he appeared to James and to all the apostles. And then even Paul says himself, So he stands as an eyewitness to the risen Christ, and then he names the apostles whom he co-labored with in the gospel ministry, and also names this great group of people that were eyewitnesses to the risen Christ, namely over 500 brethren at one time, which is a great gathering, a great gathering indeed. The gospel is the message of truth. It is based, it is rooted, it is founded upon historical reality. It is spiritual, true. Absolutely. But let us not forget that it is also historical and that it has happened. And it has happened. It is the message of truth. For it speaks of the man who is the way and the truth and the life. It's true. It's true. Secondly, Paul gives the gospel an interesting term. He calls it, look with me, verse 13, the gospel of your salvation. The gospel of your salvation. So, he points out the Ephesians. One, the gospel is truth. It is a message of historical truth, of scriptural truth, of, 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 of spiritual truth. It's true. And then he says, you've been saved by it. This gospel that is historical and is objectively true, it's also subjectively changed your lives. You've been saved, brethren. How do we know this? Uh, Verse 1 of this very chapter. Verse 1 of chapter 1. To the saints who are at Ephesus and who are faithful in Christ Jesus. This book is addressed to the believers in Ephesus. It's to them. It's for them. And what does he say? You've been saved by this gospel. By this specific truth of the Lord Jesus Christ. 
they've been saved. Saved not by their works, but by His grace. By His grace. Titus 3, 5. He saved us not on the basis of deeds, which we have done in righteousness, but according to His mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewing by the Holy Spirit, whom He poured out richly, or upon us richly through Jesus Christ our Savior. Here in the beginning part of this verse, as Paul says, In Him you also, after listening to the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation. This is referencing the outward call. The outward call. That is the call of the gospel that is given to all creation, all peoples. That we are commanded to give to all. Even though we know that God has chosen a people to himself, a specific people whom he will redeem, and they are the ones whom God will bestow grace, and the rest he will live, uh, leave to continue on in their sin, which they so love, we are nonetheless commanded to preach the gospel to all, because we ourselves do not know who the elect are. We do not know. We do not know their identity. And so we are to give the outward call. It is outside of men. And it may or may not affect them. They themselves may indeed be indifferent to it. And not be changed by it. And that's general. It's a general call. And it is not always changing lives. For it can be resisted. It can be despised. It can be ignored. It can be hated. Those are some realities of the outward call of the gospel. Secondly, I want to make this second point clear as well. The inward call. The inward call. What does Paul say next? He says, having also believed. Having also believed. Now we ask ourselves the question, where, from where did belief come? From where did their acceptance of Christ come? Did it come from their own wills? Did it come from their own strength or own their own power? Did it come by some decision that they themselves made? Well, no, it did not. It came by God granting it to them. Jesus said, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up on the last day. Man cannot come to God because he will not come to God in his state of sin, in his deadness in sin, and therefore God must effectually draw him by his Spirit. By his Spirit. The Spirit grants belief. Later on in Ephesians, Paul says, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. The entirety of salvation is the gift of God. Even faith itself, which receives salvation, which receives the, the forgiveness of sin, the imputed righteousness of Christ, that is also a gift. And that's one reality under the grand reality of the inward call. John 1, 12 says, But as many as received him, that is Christ, to them he gave the right to become children of God, even to those who believe in his name, verse 13, who were born, not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. So oftentimes preachers will quote verse 12 and even admonish sinners as if they had the power in themselves to come to Christ. And I'm not saying there is anything wrong with admonishing and pleading with the lost, but we ought to do it knowing in our hearts and minds and even making it known to the sinner themselves that they cannot come unless God effectually draws them. For we must finish the sentence. We must read on into verse 13, which says that those who were born and those who are born again and those who will in the future be born again are born again not of blood, that is, of course, by an inheritance or by some uh, fleshly advantage, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. In other words, it is nothing of natural ability, but of supernatural accomplishment by the power of God. Paul elsewhere in his epistle to the Philippians very clearly states in the first chapter in verse 23 
He says, for you, for to you it has been granted for Christ's sake, not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for his sake. What have they been granted for Christ's sake? Belief in him. Belief in him. Belief in the gospel is granted by the power of God, by the power of of God, and the Spirit of God specifically is, is, the, is the member of the Trinity that, that causes this to take place in the heart of the believer, in the heart of the elect. It is the Spirit that gives life. The flesh profits nothing. The Spirit grants this inward call. The inward call, in its essence, is the outward call made effectual, we might say. That is, the Spirit of God coming to the dead sinner, raising them up to spiritual life, giving them ability to flee to Christ, giving them the desire to walk in holiness and purity, that is, regeneration, and then giving them repentance and faith. That the grace to turn from sin and therefore to be converted, to turn to Christ and therefore to be saved, to be justified altogether by His grace. And the distance between regeneration and conversion may be very great. Sometimes it may elapse over years. Someone may be regenerate, regenerate of the Spirit, yet not converted until years later. There may be great strivings to comprehend spiritual things and the gospel. And one day God truly does draw them to Christ and he had been doing so for that entire time by his grace. The inward call, the effectual call, as it is sometimes called, is effectual. It will always bring about the salvation of God's people, of those whom the Holy Spirit causes it to take place in. They believed because the Spirit had worked in them. He had regenerated them, raised them up to spiritual life. One of the cardinal points of Reformed theology, which is namely biblical theology, is that regeneration precedes faith. The act of faith does not cause, our, uh, cause us to be born again. It is the other way around. Being born again causes us, enables us, to believe. The Spirit must raise the dead sinner to spiritual life so that they can come to Christ, not the other way around. Man cannot come to Christ on his own. God must work in him. The Spirit of God must work in him. And that is the Spirit's work. The Father predestines, the Son atones for this specific people, the Spirit comes to them causes them to be born again, and then to have faith in Christ. That's the order. That's the ordo salutis. Regeneration precedes faith. And that is the effectual call. The Spirit's work in the hearts of God's people, causing them to come to Christ. To respond, we might say, to that outward call that is given. Thirdly, let us consider the Spirit's sealing. The Spirit's sealing. Verse 13, as we continue on. He says, You were sealed in Him with the Holy Spirit of promise. Firstly, the recipients of this precious grace. He says, You. You. Verse 12, He was speaking of we. And then He says, You. You. God's mercies and grace, God's saving power has been manifested toward his people. Both Jew and Gentile alike, he has shown great mercy toward them. In fact, I want to read, beginning in verse 1 of this chapter, with a different emphasis. Read through a few verses I read er through earlier, but pay attention to how many times Paul speaks on God working in relation to his people and for his people, out of love for his people. Begin verse, in, beginning in verse 1. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God to the saints who are at Ephesus and who are faithful in Christ Jesus. 
Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ, just as He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world, that we would be holy and blameless before Him. In love He predestined us to adoption as sons through Jesus Christ to Himself, according to the kind intention of His will, to the praise of the glory of His grace, which He freely bestowed on us in the Beloved." Even continuing, verse 7, In Him we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of His grace, which He lavished on us. In all wisdom and insight, He made known to us the mystery of His will according to His kind intention, which He purposed in Him. That's powerful. That's the power of God in the gospel. In saving a people to Himself, we, brethren, are objects of divine love, of divine grace, of divine mercy. We are vessels of mercy, as Paul says in Romans 9. Secondly, we consider with me the one in whom we are sealed. He says, you were sealed in him, in him. Now, the Greek word here for seal is Safragizo, safragizo, and it means to seal, to mark with a seal. And it's actually derived from safragis, which means a seal, a signet ring. And in ancient history, kings had signet rings that bore a specific inscription on it so that when they placed it on perhaps, let's say, a letter, or on a, a seal perhaps on a temple, or anything to that effect that needed a, um, a, a, an official approval, we might say authoritative approval and sealing upon it, they would impress the ring into that uh, wax or whatever material they were using, and it would bear the king's mark. It would bear his mark of his signet ring. And likewise, we brethren, children of the king, have been sealed, as it were. He has placed we might say his signet ring upon our hearts and we bear the brand mark upon us and we are forever more changed. Quite interestingly enough, in the Septuagint, which is the Greek version of the Old Testament, in the Apocrypha, which is of course not a part of the inspired scripture, it is a deuterocanonical uh, in the in Apocrypha, this word safragis, uh, safragis shows up uh, a couple of times in one of the books in there called Baal and the Dragon, which is, a, as I said, an apocryphal, so it's a doubtful that it was it actually happened. But it was a story on um, a man by the name of Daniel in Babylon, with the king of Babylon. Uh, and to put a long story short... The people in Babylon worshipped a false god, uh, Baal. And uh, apparently, the king had been convinced that this man, or excuse me, that this false god uh, could consume and eat food and would eat large amounts of food. And so, the king would continually have people feeding this, uh, this idol that they had formed. However, uh, Daniel points out to the king that it's just an idol. It's not organic. It's not living. It's false. And does so, interestingly enough, I'd encourage you to go read it yourself at home. Uh, you can find it online for free. That uh, Bell and the Dragon, you can find this uh, online for free. I'd encourage you to read through it. Interestingly enough, in the in the story, um, Daniel mocks uh, this, this false god and uh, tells the king that uh, they should seal the, the chamber, uh, to seal the, the, uh, the shrine where this idol was located, uh, and this, the king should put his signet ring on that uh, and have it sealed so no one's going to break in. They should put food in there and leave it overnight and come and check on it. And uh, Daniel even goes so far as to say, if he does not eat the food, uh, let me, let I myself be killed. Or if he, uh, if he does not eat the food, then I might, my life will be spared and the false prophets of this false god, Bel should be killed uh, specifically and the way that the story portrays it would be thrown in the lion's den uh, to be eaten alive anyways um, so this happens and come to find out um, they check the next day after the king has set his signet ring on it's been sealed the shrine has been shut sealed shut apparently from what they perceived however 
Um, they walk in and the food is missing. It's gone. And of course, we know, all of us know, it was a false god, so it certainly didn't eat the food. And Daniel, of course, knew this as well and pointed out to the king that, excuse me, excuse me, the priests, the false priests, we might say, of this false god had actually made uh, uh, entrances through the back, false entrances to go and take the food uh, away to make it appear to the king, to trick the king, and to think that this is this god could actually do such a thing. But it's interesting that in that story there, we find an example of the king setting his signet ring upon this shrine of this false god. And uh, it, that appears there in that story, that, that, that Greek word there, uh, Saphragis. But nonetheless, God the Father has, as it were, set his seal upon us, and it is his spirit. His spirit is a divine seal. It bears the inscription in us. We've been sealed by the Spirit of God, by the grace of God. That's powerful, brethren. Let that encourage your heart. Let that bring you joy. To know that we've been sealed. It carries with it authority, weightiness, officiality. That it's not false, it's authentic. It has not been faked, it is real. In fact, we know from the book of 1 John, it says we know that we are His by the Spirit whom He has given us. And the question arises, how do we know that we have the Spirit? Quite simple, my friend. The fruit of the Spirit. Is it there in your life? For if the fruit of the Spirit is not present, certainly the Spirit is not. Those fruit that are love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. The one in whom we are sealed is Christ. We are sealed, yes, by the Spirit as we've considered, but in whom are we sealed? In Christ. In Christ alone is salvation found. As we looked at earlier, Paul says in Romans 8.1, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, who are in Him. What does it mean to be in Christ? It means to be on His side, to be in His kingdom, to be in His service, to be in obedience to Him, to be forgiven because of His death upon the cross, and to be wrapped in His righteousness. That is, regarded by the Father as having lived Christ's life. These things are what it means to be in Christ. We are sealed in Him by the Spirit. And that's what it says. The one who seals us in whom in him is the Spirit. Because he says, in who, you were sealed in him with the Holy Spirit of promise. The Spirit has been given. The Spirit has come forth. And he has borne his fruit in our lives, that is, in the lives of his people. And he will never leave us nor forsake us, as we know from Scripture. He is the eternal God. His purposes are not thwarted, but He does whatever He pleases. Our God is in the heavens. He does all that He pleases. And it is quite interesting to consider that in the Old Testament, the, pro the coming of the Spirit was promised. It was not something that randomly came about, but had been planned by God. For we know from Ezekiel 36, in verse 26, God promising the new covenant says, Moreover, I will give you a new heart and, and put a new spirit within you. And I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. This is the nature of regeneration, my dear brethren. This is the nature of regeneration, friend. God taking out the heart of stone and giving to the sinner a heart of flesh. He says, verse 27, I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes. And you will be careful to observe my ordinances. So, the Spirit is in them, and what immediately happens? They walk in God's statutes, and that's very good that we consider that. How do you know, how do I know that the Spirit is in me? Does He speak into my ear? I am in you. Does He give me a vision or a dream in the middle of the night? No. What does He do? Verse 27 of Ezekiel 36 clearly says, that God puts the Spirit within His people. And what happens immediately? 
They walk in his statutes. Not only that, they are careful to observe his ordinances. Those two phrases. One is saying something generally and then the other is saying it specifically. For he says, I will make you walk in my statutes and you will be careful to observe my ordinances. So they're going to obey the law. They're not only going to obey the law, they're going to be careful to obey the law. It's going to be something that they scrupulously pursue. Why? Because the Spirit is in them. Therefore, if you do not desire and do not pursue with zeal and fervor and passion, obedience to Christ, you do not have the Spirit of Christ. We know that if you don't have the Spirit of Christ, you don't have Christ. And Christ does not have you. The Spirit produces fruit. In the next chapter, Ezekiel 37, God says again, verse 14, I will put my spirit within you and you will come to life. And I will place you on your own land. Then you will know that I, the Lord, have spoken and done it, declares Yahweh. As if it was not enough, For God to have promised it once in Ezekiel 36, he repeats himself again in Ezekiel 37. I will give you my spirit. He will be in you. And he will cause you to walk in my statutes. We are sealed. We are sealed. We are kept. We are preserved. We do not spoil as it were. Our faith does not Grow cold, it may for a season, but nonetheless God will come to us and sanctify us and draw us near to unto himself once more. How? By his Spirit. And sealing us. How it manifests itself. And I covered this briefly a moment ago in Ezekiel 36. But I want to cover it a little more thoroughly here. How it manifests itself. How does the Spirit's sealing manifest itself in the lives of believers? 1 John 5.18 We know that no one who is born of God sins, but he who is born of God keeps him, and the evil one does not touch him. How are we born of God? By the Spirit. By the Holy Spirit raising us to spiritual life, giving us grace to come to Christ for life. And what is the result of that? God keeps us. We are kept. And we do not sin. And the evil one cannot touch us. We cannot any longer fall under the delusion of the enemy, of the the deceit of the evil one. But we now love the Lord Jesus Christ with an incorruptible love. Honestly, it is hard for me to, in a small way, concisely put how the Spirit's sealing manifests itself, because it manifests itself in so many ways. One of those ways Dr. Sproul speaks on, Dr. Archie Sproul says, I believe that saints do persevere in the faith, and that those who have been effectually called by God and have been reborn by the power of the Holy Spirit endure to the end. However, they preserve not because they are so diligent in making use of the mercies of God. The only reason we can give why any of us continue on in the faith is because we have been preserved. So I prefer to use the term preservation of the saints. Because the process by which we are kept in a state of grace is something that is accomplished by God. My confidence in my preservation is not my ability to preserve. Or excuse me, persevere. My confidence rests in the power of Christ to sustain me with His grace and by the power of His intercession. He is going to bring us safely home. So it manifests itself in our turning away from sin and our being protected from the enemy, being kept by God and being preserved. Being preserved. Kept from corruption. Kept from corruption. So many ways. And sadly, time will flee from me if I were to try and 
list them all. What does it result in? What does it result in in the end? What does it bring about? Why do we need to be sealed by the Spirit? Because we need to be brought to the end, to glory, to the final realization of salvation. See, brethren, we are saved. Those of us who are in Christ, we are saved. We've been saved by God's grace. However, we are looking forward to a future salvation. A salvation, as the scripture says, that will be revealed in the last time or at the last time, in the last days. When Christ returns. Jesus says, Matthew 24, 13, But the one who endures to the end, he will be saved. How do we endure? The Spirit keeps us. And what's in the end? Ultimate salvation. Glorification in Christ. Uh, forever. Glorification in glory with Christ, with the saints, with God the Father, the Spirit there, the triune God, communion with God forever. What was there in the garden is restored, but so much more. So much more. For in the garden, man had possibility of falling into sin. However, once we're in the final state of glory, there is no possibility of ever being lost. We'll be for eternally kept. Eternally kept. Revelation 22 speaks to this beautifully. In Revelation 22, verse 3, this final, this final salvation. This is the goal of the Spirit sealing us, brethren. There's something eschatological about this, the salvation, this sealing of the Spirit. Eschatological meaning that it's, it's, it's about the end times. There's a future aspect to this. It's not just for here and the now. It's for here and now and tomorrow and the next day and the next day to keep us, to carry us along to that end. Revelation 22, 3, there will no longer be any curse. And the throne of God and of the Lamb will be in it. That is, the, that is the New Jerusalem. And His bondservants will serve Him. They will see His faith and, and face, and His name will be on their foreheads. And there will no longer be any night. And they will have, they will not have need for the light of a lamp, nor the light of the sun, because the Lord God will illumine them, and they will reign forever and ever. This is what awaits the child of God who has been redeemed by Christ, who has been chosen by the Father, and who has been sealed by the Spirit, who has been effectually drawn unto Christ by the Spirit, and who now has faith in the gospel of Christ. This is what awaits them. This is what awaits them. This is what awaits us, brethren. Us. Briefly, I want to consider our need for being sealed. Even with a new nature, even with a new heart and new desires, we know that we are, as Paul says of himself in Romans 7, we are still prone to sin. Prone to wonder, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. Take my heart and seal it. Seal it for thy courts above. We are in desperate need of the Spirit sealing. For even with this new nature, we are still battling with the corruptions of the flesh. And if it were not for the overwhelming power of the Spirit, subduing our enemies, we ourselves would succumb to the temptations of the flesh. We would, we would be lost if it were not for the Spirit keeping us. We would walk away from Christ if it were not for the Spirit's keeping us in Him. This salvation the Spirit gives is not a salvation that can be lost. It's eternal salvation. It is a complete salvation. And it's a salvation that will never be taken away. It will never be revoked. It is eternal. Jesus said, I give them eternal life. If we could lose our salvation, we would have already lost it. But our salvation as it stands does not depend upon us, but upon the triune God, the Father's choice to save us, the Son's redemption, and the Spirit's sealing and constant upholding of our faith. 
So let us give him glory for that. Let us ascribe glory to the Spirit. For often do we speak of bringing glory to the Father and the Son, but let us not forget that the Spirit is the third person of the Trinity, and he is worthy of praise, worship, and adoration. Though his ministry is to point to Christ and to exalt him, he himself being the center of the gospel itself in the strictest sense, we are nonetheless to attribute to the Spirit glory, praise, and honor. Brethren, I have a few brief exhortations for you. One, I would like you, I plead with you, I would exhort you to rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. You must rejoice in light of these truths. I call upon you to stand in reaction to this precious text, to come to this passage and to look down at, at, at it as it were and then let your heads be lifted up and praise God. Rejoice in Trinitarian salvation. Rejoice in the Spirit who is at present in you, sealing you, keeping you, holding you, carrying you along by His almighty power. I call you also to rest in the Spirit's sanctifying power in you. I am not calling you to be negligent or to be lazy. However, we must rest. Brethren, we have the Sabbath rest of God. We do. We do. Spiritual rest. Rest knowing that your faith does not depend upon you. Your continuance in the faith does not depend upon you. It depends on the Spirit of God. And His power is inexhaustible. And therefore, it cannot be thwarted. His plans cannot be thwarted. His rule and reign cannot be tossed aside, as it were. Thirdly, I would encourage you to repent. Paul tells us later on in this epistle, do not grieve the Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. That text, likewise, just to note, speaks again to the eschatological aspect of of our salvation. But nonetheless, Paul exhorts the Ephesians, do not grieve the Spirit. It is a command. Let us never grieve the Spirit of God, who has so graciously chosen to come and to indwell us, for we are the temple of God. Fourthly, I call you to depend upon the Spirit. This is a little different from resting at least in this context that I'm using it in, because I'm not calling you necessarily to rest, but to depend in His strength, to depend upon His strength, to bear fruit in your life, to bear the precious fruit of the Spirit in you. Also, to you who are religious, yet are lost, and you say, well, how do I know if I'm lost? I claim to be religious. I say that I know Christ. But you say that there are some of us who are lost, and yet religious, Indeed, I do. Look at yourselves. Has the fruit of the Spirit come to fruition in your lives? Has the fruit of the Spirit come about in your lives? Do you try and follow the letter of the law but do not have love? Love for your fellow man and love for God? Instead, you are simply, as it were, a whitewashed tomb filled with dead men's bones? If so, you are self-deceived. You were deluded. Therefore, I call you to look at yourself, to examine yourselves, you who name the name of Christ, to ask, has the Spirit of Christ been given to me, or have I deceived myself, and is the truth therefore not in me? If not, I call you to repent. And you yourselves fall under the category of the next group of people I would like to address. And thirdly, this third group of people are those of you who are outright lost and know it. My exhortation to you is simply to come to Christ. But not in your own strength but instead in the strength of the Spirit of God, in His strength. For no one can come to Christ unless the Father draws him. And they are drawn unto Christ by the effectual work of the Spirit of God in their hearts. So we have seen here in this chapter in Ephesians 1.13, the outward call, the inward call, and the Spirit's sealing.
God is so holy, so holy. The triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit hates sin, and we have sinned. He gave His law, but we broke it. You shall not lie, you shall not steal, you shall not fornicate. We have broken God's law, and we deserve hell. But Christ died upon the cross, bearing the wrath of the Father against sin, and was raised on the third day. And all who embrace Christ are saved by His grace, forgiven of sin, justified. And they are given new hearts, and they are given the Spirit, all by His grace and all for His glory. And we are sealed by the Spirit to the glory of God. So may the Father, Son, and Spirit be brought all glory in all things forever. Amen. Let's pray. Father, I pray that you would bless your word. It has gone forth now. Be glorified in us and in all things forevermore. Amen and amen.